Good morning, everyone. We've got the sun out this morning. See, it's going to be a nice warm day. Certainly the Word of God will warm your hearts, but unfortunately, as Eddie said, the things we have to look at today, they didn't have very warm hearts. <laughs> but this is what Jeremiah was dealing with, and we start looking at a couple of the kings. We'll probably spend uh, the Sunday school class on Jehoiakim, and then we'll look in the afternoon program today at Zedekiah. And you get a real flavor for why God at this point would say to Jeremiah, there's, there's no real alternative. Uh, the best solution is to simply take everybody out of the kingdom and regrow them in Babylon and then send them back at another time. So that's the plan is to have a look at King Jehoiakim this morning. And we'll uh, hopefully have a look at some of the things he did wrong and, and learn some lessons from that about what we want to do in terms of ourselves. Just so that we're straight on uh, where we're at, when you look at Jehoiakim, remember, uh, I know it's a little bit fuzzy today. I think the only way to make that come in better is to pull the whole thing back. I don't know whether that bothers anybody back there, but uh, it's just too close. This projector won't, uh, it won't go that low. It won't go that close. So we'll try that. Is that better? Yeah. You want to come way back here? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Unless somebody else knows. Ah, there's why. Uh huh. It wasn't that. It was the. Thanks. Ed. See? You gotta learn. It's a smart projector. See? It's got focus and it also has distance. Huh. So you can do both. Yeah. You like that one? All right. We'll get something in between. How's that? All right, well, I'll live with that. Did you like that fuzzy stuff better? <laughs> when it gets that fuzzy, everybody just sort of tunes out. <laughs> so that's the plan. We'll, uh, we'll pick it up with Jehoiakim. Thank you for that. So remember, Jehoiakim, he's the one that the people of the land didn't want. They bypassed him, picked Jehoahaz, but Jehoahaz got carried down to Egypt by Pharaoh Necho, and Pharaoh Necho sets Jehoiakim up as king. So that's where we're at today. We'll look at Jeremiah's prophecies about Jehoiakim himself and have a, hopefully learn some things about him. When you look at it in terms of the timeline, which is always good, not just in terms of Josiah's children, but remember Josiah here, he has Jehoahaz. He's also got Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin. So all three, well, actually these three right here were also were all sons of Josiah. And now we're into this 11-year period of Jehoiakim right here. And then we'll finish off this afternoon with Zedekiah, another 11-year period, which is really the end. Uh, that's basically where you're at. If you ever look at the, uh, the timeline that I created, you can see that we're in this period right in here with Jehoiakim. Uh, and you can see there's quite a clump of chapters in terms of what's going on here in Jeremiah. And if you blow that up big enough so that you can see it, uh, we're going to look at this period right in here where Pharaoh Necho had just defeated Josiah. So Necho had been up at Carchemish. He fought with the Assyrians and, uh, and, and lost. And so he comes back on down and he picks up uh, in this case, he picks up uh, Jehoahaz, and uh, he's, he's going to come on down. So, sorry, he actually, he won that, that round. So Pharaoh Necho won the first round. Later on, though, he goes back up there, and he loses, and that's when the Babylonians are going to take over. So in the first round right here, he actually wins, comes back down. He picks up Jehoahaz, takes him, and uh, sets up Jehoiakim as king. And then only a few years later, this fourth year right here of Jehoiakim, look at all the chapters of, of Jeremiah that focus in on this period right there. That's because that's where the major change took place in Jeremiah's life. Instead of the Egyptians being the power at that point, then the Babylonians had become the power. There was another war just three, four years later, and this time the Babylonians won. Pharaoh Necho was defeated, and he went back home defeated, and, uh, and God at, at this point was using the Babylonians to come down from the north as Jeremiah had predicted. So during Jehoiakim's reign, all the prophecies Jeremiah had been predicting about this enemy coming down from the north, the boiling pot that was facing away from the north, it was going to spill over on Israel. Jeremiah's prophecies were finally vindicated in this king's reign. And you would think that if you had lived through this and people saw Bible prophecy coming to pass, you would think you'd get all excited and figure out that, wow, this, this man's been telling us the truth. But instead, they just uh, they turned on Jeremiah again, and it just didn't turn out at all like I think Jeremiah had hoped and expected. This is when Daniel is going to get taken captive to Babylon, and uh, you'll find out Jehoiakim actually rebels from Nebuchadnezzar at this point. 
and uh, he tries at least to pull off a rebellion that gets quenched in. But he stays in as king. He gets his 11 years. But then right in here at the end of his life, you're going to see that Jehoiakim, in the reading that we just did, that the prediction was that he was going to be uh, left outside to, to die the, the death of a, of a donkey. He's just going to be left outside the city of Jerusalem. Uh, not what you would normally get in a king's burial. And the reason is, is because the Babylonians came down again at that period, had a siege on Jerusalem, and nobody could go anywhere. And then Jehoahaz, uh, or then his son, rather, Jehoiachin, is going to take over as the king. So that's the period that you're in right now. Right now, lots of changes taking place during Jehoiakim's reign. So and we'll look at what Jeremiah has to say about him. Now, there's really a few uh, key chapters in Jeremiah that focus in on this period. One of them is Jeremiah 26. So the nice thing today is that unlike yesterday's last class, where we had to go through like 18 chapters, uh, today you get to focus on maybe about three. And uh, we'll look at those and hopefully walk away with some idea of what's going on. So Jeremiah 26. This is in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim in the first verse, probably around this fourth year. You're probably around this period when the Egyptians lost up at Carchemish. They come back down. The Babylonians sweep through the land. And Nebuchadnezzar now has taken away uh, Jehoahaz. And he's, he's, now he's, gonna, uh, set, he's actually coming in and in, uh, in, in, invaded during this period, the fourth year of Jehoiakim. And what he has to do, Nebuchadnezzar has to decide, is he going to leave Jehoiakim in as king or is he going to put in somebody else? And it, it looks like he, he may have even taken him up to Babylon at this period, but he decides to leave Jehoiakim in as the king. So that's about where you are in this fourth year of Jehoiakim. So you're right at this period when Daniel would have been taken captive. So Daniel's gone up to Babylon. And this is where we are in Jeremiah 26. So, thus says the Lord in verse 2, Stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah and come to worship in the Lord's house. And all the, wor all the words that I command you to speak to them, do not diminish a word. Perhaps everyone will listen and turn from his evil way. And you wonder, like, why now? Why would they listen now when they wouldn't listen before? And I think what God was hoping here and Jeremiah was that now that Jeremiah's prophecies had been vindicated, now that they saw the king from the north was actually going to take over, the Egyptians were no longer in power, now that Jeremiah, all those things he'd been saying now for years, really, over 20 years, were now actually coming to pass. And so the hope was that some people would realize as they saw prophetic events taking place that maybe now you could grab their attention and they'd listen to you and maybe we could change some hearts. So I think that's what they're hoping at this point. That's why God would say, perhaps everyone will listen and turn from his evil way that I may relent concerning the calamity which I purpose to bring on them because of the evil of their doings. Now, isn't it interesting to notice that after all this time, look at how patient and kind and compassionate our God is. That after all of this, and all the things we looked at yesterday, and all the reasons why, what right does my beloved have in her house, God is willing to change his mind if we change our ways. I, th I think that's really good about our God. It's good to know that we have a Father who loves us like that. And all he's waiting for is the day in which we come on board. So that no matter what has happened in somebody's life, he simply wants us to learn from those experiences, eventually change our ways, and, and come back to him. Remember, uh, I was reading a, a book by Brother Barling at one time, I think it was, and he just said that uh, God was more interested in the last lap of our life than he was in all the rest. And uh, there's an interesting concept about that in terms of like if you ever run on a track and you're running a mile or you're running like 20 miles on a, on a track. And in the end, it's like in the last lap, you find out who wins. Uh, but that's what God is interested in uh, in terms of our life is what, where are we at at the end of our life? What, what happened at the end? What did all those experiences do to us? And, which is why we have to care about and, and be careful about what happens at the end. So, verse 4, he says, You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, If you will not listen to me, to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to heed the words of my servants, the prophets whom I sent to you, both rising up early and sending them, but you have not heeded, then I will make this house like Shiloh. Ooh, and make the house like Shiloh. And I will make this city a curse to all the inhabitants of the earth. Now, at this point in time, what's in Shiloh? Shiloh is where the tabernacle was when they first came in the land. Joshua came up, set it in the land. They put the tabernacle up in Shiloh, right? The tabernacle, God's house was there. His tent was there. The ark was there. So what's in Shiloh right now? Not today. Back then, when Jeremiah wrote this, what's in Shiloh? Nothing. 
Nothing. It all got torn away. Remember they sent the ark out into battle and the Philistines took it? David eventually brought it back into Jerusalem. What happened to the tabernacle? It looks like the Philistines came down through the land at that point, And the tabernacle, they packed it all up, got it out of Shiloh, and they brought it down and it ended up at Gibeah. Remember later on in David's life. Shiloh, gone. And God says, even though I left my tabernacle in Shiloh for years, hundreds of years, and yet, took it out. Wiped it out. Don't think just because you have my temple in Jerusalem that that's going to make a difference for you. I'll clean it out. I've done it before, and I'll do it again. So that was major thing to say. To say you're, you're going to make this house like Shiloh. In other words, the whole temple is going to be demolished and gone, and God's ark isn't going to be there anymore. No Shekinah glory in the holy place. That was a huge statement to make for Jeremiah. So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words to them in the house of the Lord. Oh boy, what's going to happen now? So, as Jeremiah 26 at verse 8, now it happened when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, that the priests and the prophets and all the people, they seized him saying, you will surely die. This is how they responded to this. And so here you are at a point where God says, go talk to them. Maybe now they're going to listen to you. Imagine how Jeremiah felt. He's probably a little pumped up thinking, yeah, maybe now they're going to hear. Maybe they're going to respond now. Maybe everybody's going to listen to what I have to say because the Babylonians really are in power. They're going to come down. And he goes out and says it, and they grab him and they say, you're going to die. And that's, that's the response he gets. I mean, this is Jeremiah's life. It just went like ups and the downs like that. Uh, if you were there, it just like, it would be amazing to watch this happen. And you just like feel for the man. He's, he's trying to do what God has said. And look at the reason. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? What are you doing saying things like that? It's like treason in our country. You don't say those kind of things. And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. So there they are in the house of the Lord that he just said, This whole place is going to become like Shiloh, and Jerusalem is going to be wiped out with no inhabitants. So when the princes of Judah, in verse 10, heard these things, they came up to the king's house, to the house of the Lord, and sat down at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. And the priests and the prophets, you know, i got to notice the players here. These are like teams that are, that are forming. we got the priests and the prophets on one team, and we got they spoke to the princes and all the people on the other. And they say, this man deserves to die. All right, so we got the priests and the prophets. See that group right there? They didn't like Jeremiah at all the priests and the prophets, because he was totally against what they were doing. So they spoke to the princes and all the people, this man deserves to die, for he's prophesied against the city, as you have heard with your ears. So they're in the gate, they're in the new gate at the, at the Lord's house, and so the court is in session. They're going to hold court right now and find out what they're going to do with Jeremiah. This is a point, you know, at, at this chapter right now, at this point, they're going to hold a court session at the gate, and they're going to decide Jeremiah's life. Shall we kill him right now? That's what they wanted to do. So here they go. Then Jeremiah spoke. So he gets to give his defense. to so all the princes and all the people saying, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against the city with all the words that you have heard. Now, therefore, amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord, your God, and then the Lord will relent concerning the doom he's pronounced against you. See, he comes in with this consistent message. See, Jeremiah, unlike yesterday, he's on board with God. Now he is ready to go. And now when God says, you say it, he goes and says it. And even when they want to kill him, he comes in and he says, you've got to change your ways, you've got to amend your ways, and maybe then God will relent concerning the doom that he's pronounced against you. But as for me, look it, I'm in your hand. Here I am, do with me as seems good and proper to you. Go ahead and kill me. But if you don't change your ways, God's going to wipe you out and you will be like Shiloh and Jerusalem will have no inhabitants. Know for certain, if you put me to death, you will certainly bring innocent blood on yourselves and on the city and on the inhabitants. For truly the Lord has sent me to speak to you all these words in your hearing. So that's Jeremiah's defense at the court session. So you keep going. I mean, this is like you hold court today. You get to get up as, as a witness and you give your defense. So then the princes and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, see how this is playing out? This is how the teams are set. Jeremiah gives his defense, 
Then the princes and the people speak to the priests and the prophets, and they say, this man doesn't deserve to die. He's spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. So the people, you know, in this case, and the princes, there were some princes of Jehoiakim who actually sided with Jeremiah in this case. And some of the people that were there listening sided with Jeremiah. And they, they rise up to his defense and they stand with him and they say, he doesn't deserve to die. He's just speaking to us in the name of the Lord. Then certain elders of the land rose up and spoke to the assembly of the people. So now we got the old folks coming in, the elders that have some past history and wisdom. And watch what they do here. They sway the court in a sense. They said, Micah of Morsha prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and spoke to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem will become heaps of ruins, and the mountain of the temple like bare hills of the forest. Now, when Micah was told, when Micah prophesied that to Hezekiah, what had just happened is the Assyrians had come down and wiped out the northern kingdom. This is over 100 years ago. And what the Assyrians intended to do and what God was going to do at that point was use the Assyrians to come down and wipe out Jerusalem. And Micah at that time prophesies. And he says to Hezekiah, because of you, look at what's going to happen. And that's how he actually said it when you read Micah's prophecy. Because of you, Jerusalem will be plowed. And Hezekiah, what did he do? How did he respond when Micah said things to that king like Jeremiah is saying today? Well, did Hezekiah, the king of Judah and all Judah, did they ever put him to death? Did he not fear the Lord and seek the Lord's favor? And the Lord relented concerning the doom which he had pronounced against them. But we are doing a very great evil against ourselves. Now, when you look at Micah's prophecy, if you just ever scan through that, you can see in Micah chapter 3, you can see what he did. This would be in the days of Hezekiah. God was intended at this point to wipe out the community if they didn't change. So it's a very similar situation to Jeremiah's. You know, the same kind of thing. These are conditional prophecies. I think a lot of times when we read the Bible, we just think that prophecies are just like unconditional, and that they all are, because there are some unconditional prophecies. But there are other prophecies that were given that were conditional upon the behavior of the people. And it's important to realize the difference between the two. When God talks about what he's going to do for Israel, it's unconditional. The promises to Abraham, unconditional. But when a prophet would come in and say, because of how you're behaving, God intends to do this, they were conditional prophecies based on how the people responded. Just like with Jonah, 40 days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. And you can say, well, that was a lie. It never happened. Did not right then, at least, in 40 days. But that's because it was a conditional prophecy. And when the people responded, God didn't do what he had intended to do at that time. And this was the claim right now. Let's, this is like Hezekiah's time. Let's look at this. Jeremiah is doing what happened with, with, same thing with Micah. So what Micah came in and did is he said in verse 1 there to the heads of Jacob and the rulers of the house of Israel, he came in and told them, you know, it's, it's just like the priests and the prophets of Jeremiah's time. You hate good and you love evil. evil. You strip the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones. You take advantage of the people. This is what they were doing. They eat up the flesh of his people. They, they treat them like sacrifices, in other words, and boil them in the, in the pot. And they're going to cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. And he'll hide his face from them at that time because they've done evil deeds. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who make my people stray, who chant peace while they chew with their teeth. Well, see, isn't that interesting? This is what the prophets were doing in Jeremiah's time. They were out there telling everybody, oh, peace, peace. Everything's going to be peaceful. You got anything for me today? Did you like that message? Uh, where's the food? Who brought? Where's the pet one? You bring the, bring the lunch? As long as you have lunch, right? That's good. See, that's what they did. They said, peace, while there's food there, they can chew, but they prepare war against him who puts nothing in their mouths. So if you didn't bring anything today, forget you. I got some things I can say about you. You didn't bring to the potluck, right? This is what the prophets did. And this is what was happening in Jeremiah's time as well. So what happened with Micah is he gave the prophecy in Micah 3 at verse 9. So he said, here you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, directed right at the leaders who abhor justice and they pervert the, all the, the equity. They build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity because they were building up all their own stuff at the expense of the people, taking bribes and everything. So in verse 12, therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field and Jerusalem become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the temple of the Lord like bare hills of the forest. You know, that didn't happen. 
at that time. That was 110 years ago. And God patiently waited 110 years because Hezekiah responded. And it's great to know that about our God. It's, that's a lot of his prophecies like that were conditional, waiting for people to respond. So this was the argument that's being used back here in Jeremiah when the elders came along and they said, all right, look back in our archives, what happened? When Micah did this with Hezekiah, Hezekiah didn't kill him. Hezekiah responded. He changed his ways and God did relent of the doom that he had pronounced against them. So then the princes come forward. It's their turn now in Jeremiah 26. So now you get the, the, the rest of the court case. Now those that were prosecuting, the prosecutors come in, and here they go. They're going to present their case against Jeremiah. All right. So now there was also a man who prophesied in the name of the Lord, Urijah, the son of Shemaiah of kiriath Jerem, who prophesied against the city and against this land according to all the words of Jeremiah. So you see now they're going to give a different case. So when Jehoiakim the king, now they're giving a current case, all right? This is the king we're in right now, Jehoiakim. Not Hezekiah, Jehoiakim. Here's Jehoiakim's past history. You've got to do it right. You've got to do it the way King Jehoiakim wants to do it. This is our current history right now. So when King Jehoiakim and all his mighty men and all the princes heard the words, the king wanted to put him to death. But when Urijah heard it, he was afraid, and he fled on down to Egypt. Right? Did he get away? Oh, then Jehoiakim, the king, sent men to Egypt, Elnathan, the son of Akbor, and other men who went with him to Egypt, and they brought Urijah from Egypt, and they brought him to Jehoiakim, the king, who killed him with the sword. I mean, that's what goes on in King Jehoiakim's reign. And cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. But after the court case was finished, and Jeremiah had had his peace, and the, the elders had come in and gave him their defense, and the prosecution came in and gave their case against Jeremiah. The chapter ends with, nevertheless, the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, so that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. Now, if you remember that family tree of Jeremiah, Shaphan's family, way over there on the other side, Shaphan's family stood for the truth. This is the Shaphan that was with Josiah and Hilkiah the priest when they found the book of the law in the temple. And his family was unbelievably cemented in truth. And they stood up for Jeremiah at this point, and they had influence over the people. And in the end, the court case finished, and Jeremiah was not killed. But there's going to be a change taking place in Jeremiah's life, I think, because of this event. So what happens after this chapter is you move on to Jeremiah 36, when you follow through these chronologically. And Jeremiah 36 tells us in the first verse that we're in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. But I think you'll see that what's happened is something has changed now about Jeremiah's freedom. Before, he could just go out there and speak the word of the Lord. And he got all excited that maybe he was going to change the people's hearts. But now things are a little bit different. Jeremiah is going to be barred from the temple as a result of what just happened. So you'll see that in Jeremiah 26, in Jeremiah 36. So it came to pass in the fourth year, all right? That's where we are right now. He says to, uh, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, take a, a scroll of a book and write on it all the words I've spoken to you against Israel, against Judah, against all the nations from the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah even to this day. See how this works? Every time God wanted to impact a king, when he really wanted to hit the king at that point and the people, when an invasion was taking place, fourth year of Jehoiakim, you take all the prophecies of Jeremiah and you compile them together in such a way that maybe the people now will get it. Maybe they'll listen. I think this is what Jeremiah tended to do every time there was an invasion, which is why the way the book is set up in the end was the way it was left for Zedekiah. And I think that, that suggestion in Cook's commentary is probably a good one as to why Jeremiah is so out of order. It's in order thematically, not in order according to chronology, because he's trying to get a theme across, not some kind of chronological sequence. But for us, it's nice to go back and look at the chronological sequence so we, we can get the events right, and now we can try to piece together the themes as you go along. So what happened in verse 4, all right? Then Jeremiah, he calls Baruch, right, the son of Neriah. I like the way you read that today, Baruch. That's how the Jews say it over in Israel, isn't it? We always called him Baruch when I was growing up, and then you find out he's actually Baruch, the son of Neriah. And he wrote on a scroll, uh, in a book, at the instruction of Jeremiah, all the words of the Lord which he had spoken to him. So he copies all the prophecies again. This fellow, he did this a few times. He was a, a good copier for Jeremiah. 
And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am confined. I cannot go into the house of the Lord. See the restriction now put on him as a result of what had happened? We're not going to have that trouble again in, in the temple anymore. We're not going to go through that again, so you're not allowed there. You can't go there anymore. So this is what's happening. Jeremiah now is starting to be confined. And you'll see more and more limits put on. He gets put in prison, gets dumped in the pit in the end. Uh, this is what's happening as you get near the end. So he says to Baruch, you go therefore and read the scroll, which uh, I've written at my dictation, the words of the Lord and the hearing of the people in the Lord's house uh, on the day of fasting. Now see, he picks a specific day. On the day of fasting, and you shall also read them in the hearing of all Judah have come from their cities. It may be that they will present their supplication before the Lord and everyone will turn from his evil way for great is the anger and the fury that the Lord has pronounced against his people. So Baruch did it. He went in and he read the prophecies and uh, he took him in. So when you're looking at what's going on in this fourth year of Jehoiakim, I don't know whether you can remember that in terms of like a key year, but a lot of things are happening in this fourth year, which is why so many of Jeremiah's prophecies are compiled in this fourth year. It's a focal point of what Jeremiah is trying to do to influence the people. So Nebuchadnezzar had just beat Pharaoh. He had now the, the, the evidence was there that Nebuchadnezzar was going to come down from the north, as Jeremiah had been saying. He carried away captives. You know that Daniel was taken away captives, and so were many others. In fact, he took some of the best Jews of the land and carried them away captive and uh, tried to train them, become um, members of his cabinet. So Jeremiah's prophecies were vindicated, but instead of it actually opening a door for Jeremiah, he gets barred from the temple at this point. So they probably thought it was a good time to write down all the prophecies at this point. Not a whole lot of risk that they would be destroyed because there was some credibility and some of the people were starting to realize, eh, what Jeremiah said really did happen. And so Baruch writes them all down, they compile them together and have an opportunity to try to influence the people. And you're looking at, what, about 23 years now have gone by since Jeremiah first wrote. And uh, Jeremiah 25 is probably another chapter that would be about this same, same year when it was written. So that's where we're at in that period. Now you look at why would he pick a fast day? I, I think what would happen is that Jeremiah thought, all right, if we're going to get the word out to the people, let's pick a day in which they're like emotionally and they're, they're ready. They're, like in a, they're in a mood where maybe they'll listen to the word. You don't go at a day when they're all at the beach somewhere. You, you catch a day when they're, when they're thinking, when they're meditating, and they've come to the temple, and maybe there'll be a bunch of them that came there for good reasons and hope to reach a lot of people. And really, his credibility had increased amongst the people. I think you can see that when uh, the princes and the prophets wanted to kill him. And in the end, they didn't, because the people at that point must not have gone along with it. And Jeremiah, because of the influence of Shaphan, uh, the influence of uh, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, he wasn't killed at that point. And he really was hoping at this point that he could change the minds of some of these people. I really think Jeremiah's hopes were really up that he might be able to make an influence. Now, you, when you're looking at Baruch, the son of Neriah, if you ever like, wonder where he came from, he's actually in that family chart there. He, he's the son of Maaseiah. You find that out in Jeremiah 32. Maaseiah was a keeper of the door to the temple. So Baruch had some connections in there to the temple himself, and it may be why it was, you know, it, it was sort of easy for him to get in there and read when Jeremiah was barred from the temple. It's actually possible that the Maasai could be the governor of the city as well. You, you really don't have enough information to know that for sure, but it's possible that that would be the case. And they probably would have had a pretty high position. You know, based on Jeremiah 52, those were people that Nebuchadnezzar thought were worth taking when they took captives away. Baruch's brother was Seriah, and Seriah in Jeremiah 51 was a quartermaster of the city. So he got like he was in charge of a quarter of the city, and it was his responsibility, they claim at night, for him to ride with the king uh, each day and decide when they went out places where they would stop if they were going out outside the city. That's what the quartermaster would do. And you can see up on that chart right there that this is the people that we're looking at right in here. We're looking at Baruch and Seriah right in here that came as the son of Neriah. Now, when you find out about Barak himself, Jeremiah asked him to read the scroll in the temple because Jeremiah was barred right now and he couldn't go there. So what does he do? He faithfully helps Jeremiah out. That's what he does. And so Barak gets in there and he reads the scroll that, you know, that Jeremiah had dictated. Now, it's interesting if you just skip ahead for a second and look up about Barak himself. There's an interesting chapter dropped in. It's one of those chapters when you're doing the readings in Jeremiah and you look at Jeremiah 45 that day and you say, oh, wow, look at that. It's only five verses. Yeah, that's a short one. Uh, Jeremiah 45. So you may remember that one. When you get to Jeremiah 45, what happened is that 
you know, if you look at this from Birick's position, what did he just do? He just copied down all of the prophecies Jeremiah had given all at once. And as he's copying them down, and he's realizing he came from this family, you know, when you look at his family from Neriah, and you look at his brother, quartermaster of the city, and you look at this family would have had some pretty good positions in, in Jerusalem. And he's writing down all these prophecies. I think what happened to him is it finally sunk in that, wow, my future isn't going to be in political positions here. God intends to wipe out this city. If the people don't respond, all these things I've been hoping for all my life, the position I was going to have in the city, things I was going to be able to do, they're not going to happen. And so Jeremiah 45 is really about Baruch. It's about him. God takes the time through Jeremiah to actually say some things to Baruch about his future and what he's thinking about right now. So I think it's probably because at this point in time, it all, it all came in at one point and he realized here's what's going to happen. And he has to remind uh, Baruch that God owns it all. It's not your stuff. It's not your position in the city. All these things that you're hoping for, they're mine. They're not yours. And God can do with them as he pleases. And sometimes that's, a, that's an important lesson for us. I mean, a lot of us sometimes are like Baruch. We get into these positions where we make our plans, we have these hopes, and we think we're going to do this and that. And God just steps in and says, no, it's not quite going to happen like that. So in Jeremiah 45, the word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch, you see, at the, he had written, after he had written these words in a book at the instruction of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. See, it all makes sense when you put the pieces together as to what was going on. This is when it focused on him and he realized it. He says, look, God says to Baruch in, in verse 3, you said... Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. I think it really hit him that this is what's going to happen when he wrote all these prophecies. So thus you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built, I will break down. Remember, Barak, these positions that you have, your spot here in the gate of the temple, or all the things that he was doing, and your brother's positions and all that, this isn't your stuff, this is mine. And, you know, every so often in ecclesial life, we have to stand back and look at that. You know, that, or even in our family, sometimes we have to do that. They're, they're really not our kids. They're God's. They're not, it's not my ecclesia. It's not our, my brothers and sisters. They're God's. It's all about God and, and what he chooses to do with our families, with our parents, with our spouses, with our children. Things he chooses to bring into their lives. We sometimes have to remind ourselves to step back and think, wait a minute, they're not really mine. They're God's. He's given them. They're gifts that he's given us to use. But there are times where he decides to take them back. And when he does, that's his choice. And he has reasons for that. And it's, it's sometimes we become so attached to all those things, to the people and the things of this life, we forget it's, it's really all God's. So he says to him in verse 5, do you seek great things for yourself? You really got these dreams of what you're going to do here in the city? Don't seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord. But I will give you your life as a prize in all places wherever you go. That's all God promised him was life. That was it. None of the stuff, none of the positions. He had to let it all go at this point. And this is a tough time for Barak after he'd written all these things down. But he's a great reminder to ourselves. So, you know, if you ever feel like that in life, brothers and sisters or young people, I think it's nice to realize that you don't have to feel like you're alone. It's not like, you know, I'm different than everybody else. This guy was like one of Jeremiah's best friends. He was with him through all these experiences. And when it finally hit what was going to happen in his life, he just like becomes depressed. He gets down and discouraged that I'm not going to get the life I thought I was going to get. And God has to help him work through it and say, look, all I've ever promised you was your life. I'll take care of that. But all the other stuff, let it go. Let it go. Our houses, our jobs, our ecclesial positions, everything. Let it all go because God's going to do what he knows is best. So, you know, you can see how that would happen. And uh, God spells it out for Barak at this point. He realizes that uh, what Jeremiah had said is really going to happen. And I think it just finally hit home for him. But he was told, I will give you your life as, as a prize. And that's really what God did. He kept him alive. 
Now, in Jeremiah 36, all right, where we're at, we can go back there. So we're at the fast, which is probably the ninth month, which was probably the same month that Nebuchadnezzar had invaded in the fourth year, because he came in in the ninth month. And this is what the Jews did then. They would take an invasion month, and they would then say, all right, whenever Nebuchadnezzar came in, we're going to establish a fast day from now on, and we're going to have it on that day of that month. And they did this for 70 years even beyond 70 years. They kept these fast days that they established. You find out about them in Zechariah's prophecies. This is what the people did. So they would establish a date. They would remember. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar came in? We're going to hold a fast day from now on every year to commemorate that. And they remembered it, and they would do sacrifices and all that. And this is what they did for all those 70 years. And then in the end, in Zechariah 7, God says, when you did all that stuff for 70 years, were you really doing that for me? Or were you just like drowning in your sorrows about what had happened to you? And that's how he looks at them, is like, who is this really for? And it really wasn't having the impact in their life that God was hoping that the, the feast days and sacrifices would. So what Barak does is he goes along and he reads the scroll, just like Jeremiah asked him in verse 10 of this chapter, in Jeremiah 36 again. And look who comes along in, in Jeremiah 36 at verse 11. So as Barak's reading the scroll, you get down to verse 11. And when Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, oh, see those names? Start to recognize those names. That's Shaphan's family. When he hears, when the good family guys, the ones who were standing with Jeremiah, the friends of Jeremiah, when they hear all the words of the Lord from the book, all right, he goes down to the king's house into the scribe's chamber, and there all the princes were sitting in, in verse 12. And he gives your names, Elisha the scribe, and he lists them all for us. And in Micaiah in verse 13, he declared to them all the words which he had heard when Barak read the book in the hearing of the people. And therefore, all the princes sent Jehudi, the son of Nethaniah, and the, the son of Shelemai, and they send him and say, take in your hand the scroll, which you have, and you heard in the reading of all the people, and so, you know, and, and come. And so Barak, the son of Neriah, he took the scroll in his hand, and they said to him, sit down now and read it in our hearing. So now Barak go, gets to go to the next level, and he goes and he reads it to all these princes, and he reads it in their hearing. And this is what's actually happening. Now, look at how these princes respond. In verse 16, it happened that when they heard all the words, that they looked in fear from one another. Imagine hearing that and looking at your, your, your spouse or looking at your friends and saying, oh, what God, look what God's going to do. This is what he intends to do. We're going to lose everything. The whole community is going to be destroyed. We're all going captive. He's going to wipe out people, and he's gonna, he really is going to make this place like Shiloh. And these princes respond with fear, and they, and they say to one another, we will surely tell the king of all these words. So they ask Barak, saying, tell us now, how did you write all these words? How did you know all this, Barak? How did you figure, was it at his dictation? Isn't that interesting how they would do that? They don't even say his name. Was it his? You know, and this is how they referred to Jeremiah at that time. Yeah, did Jeremiah tell you all this stuff? There's actually some really fun instances like this in the kings. I don't know if you remember the story of the one king who wanted to find out what's going on, so he sends, he sends his, his, uh, his, his higher-ups to go inquire the prophet. And you, you find out later on that the, the prophetess finally tells the king, and he says, here's what's really going to happen, you know, Josiah, here's what's really going to go on. And the prophetess actually says it. And when she says it, she says, here's what God intends to do. And she says, he's going to destroy the people. And then, he, then she says, do you ever notice, she says, and tell the man who sent you to me, this is what God intends to do to you. You know, it's got to be Jeremiah. It's, it's, gotta, it's in that period of Jeremiah's life where he wasn't really ready to go with the plan. And he was fighting it. He was struggling with God's plan. It's just, it's fun to go back and look at those things now and realize what was happening and the dynamics in the community back then. So anyways, in this case here, what happens at this point? Uh, these people care. They, they care about what God's going to do. They care about Jeremiah's life. So look what they say. Verse 19, the princess said to Baruch, go and hide, you and Jeremiah, and let nobody know where you are because we don't know how this is going to go down. I mean, this could be terrible. If we tell everybody what you just said, it may be that they try to grab you and kill you. So they understood the, dynam the dynamics right now. So go hide. You, you go hide, and we'll take it from here. So it, it's, just, it's fun to watch how these things play out in terms of, like, you know, ecclesial life back then. So look what they did down in, in, verse, uh, down in verse 20. 
They went to the king, and they went into the king, into the court, but they stored the scroll in the chamber of Elishama the scribe and told all the words in the hearing of the king. So they took all the stuff that Barak wrote and they, they stored it somewhere so that they didn't take it with them because they didn't want to just have the king, just, they were afraid to just like destroy it. So they stored it in the chamber where they stored the Bible. That's what they basically did in the chamber of Elishama the scribe, the ones that would copy the scriptures. And so they go down, and so the king and Jehudi, they told him to bring the scroll, and he took it from Elishama from the scribe's chamber. So now when the king finds out about this, when he hears the words at the end of verse 20, the king says, all right, grab that scroll, get it out here. And so they, they do, they have to go get it. But this is exactly what they were afraid of. So, and it gets read in verse 21 there in the hearing of uh, all the, of the princes that stood before the king. Now notice this time, it's read in the hearing of all of the princes. See, this is going to be a different group. Now we got all the princes there, not just the ones that were back here in the, at the end of verse 12. This is going to be a slightly different group as you read along here. But imagine how, you know, the people might have got excited at this point and thought, well, maybe it was going to make a change. But look at what happens. So verse 22, the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month, as we read. The fire is burning on the hearth before him. And it happens that when Jehudi had read three or four columns of the scroll, they'd open up the scroll, they'd read three or four columns, that the king took his penknife, as the new King James says, and he cut with this, the penknife, the scribe's knife, and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth, and he burned the Bible. Didn't want, he wanted to hear, but he didn't intend to respond at all. This was King Jehoiakim. The king was out of conscience. He listened. Sure. What's the word of the Lord today? Tell me what's, what's going to happen. And he didn't care at all. He just wanted to hear what he got to say. And he's probably more interested from a political standpoint of what did you just tell all the people so I know what's going on, so I know how to respond, how to deal with this problem, more so than he was ever interested in listening to it as the word of God. And so the king, he cut it all up with his pen knife, and the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. All those words that, Jer- that Baruch had copied down, all that copying that he did, and the king just cuts it all up and burns it. All of his work was burned. Yet, they were not afraid. Look at that, in verse 24. See, you have to underline those kind of things and contrast them to see the difference between this group of princes and the other group of princes. They're two different groups. One of them was with the king, his close group, and the other ones were the princes that Jehudi first went to because he knew they would be sympathetic. So these people, they weren't afraid. They didn't run their garments like the other ones would have. You know, the king nor any of his servants who heard all these words. But nevertheless, Elnathan and Delilah and Gemariah, they implored the king not to burn the scroll, but he would not listen to them. So one group of princes is begging him not to do it, and the other group is just like, eh, we don't care. No conscience at all. Word of God didn't affect them one bit. So the king commanded uh, Jeremiah, the king's son, and Sarai, the son of Azariah, and he asked him, he said, look, go down there and seize Barak the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet. But... As the other princes had suggested, they hid, and the Lord kept them hidden. And so Jeremiah was saved from this event. So what a great warning to all of us, brethren and sisters, that when we read the Bible, when we discuss it, and we talk about it with each other, and we do our readings at home, don't ever become like Jehoiakim. Don't just read it so that you sort of like know what's coming. This is what we can do sometimes in Bible prophecy. You can actually get so excited about Bible prophecy if we're not careful that we read all the news about Bible prophecy. We read all these things about Bible prophecy, and yet at the same time, we don't really get ready for that day. We're just interested in knowing all the uh, the events that are happening about what's going on in the world because we want to be up on it and we can talk about it with our brethren and sisters. But those things were supposed to change our lives, affect our consciences, and and, and bring us to God. And this is what he's doing to wake us all up and, and give us reminders that the day is coming in which his kingdom will come. And once it begins, once it comes, there will be no time to change. This was the warning of Jeremiah, and it's very similar to our day and age today. It's something we've really got to be careful about, because just studying Bible prophecy and getting excited about Bible prophecy doesn't mean you get to the goal of being conformed to the image of his son. It's one of the mechanisms to get there, but just doing it itself doesn't mean you'll be there. It doesn't mean necessarily, uh, you could study Bible prophecy, read all the current events that happened during the last week, read Milestones of the Kingdom, come to meeting and be unkind to your brethren and sisters. Or something happens in your family and you're not very nice to your spouse and you react in a terrible way to your kids. And see, this is the problem that we have today. We get caught up in all the mechanisms 
and we sometimes lose the focus of what was it supposed to do. It was supposed to change people's hearts and their lives, to soften our hearts, to help us prepare, to be ready because the day is coming. The Son of Man will come at an hour we don't expect. And we don't want to be like these people of this day that would listen to it, they'd hear about it, but they had no intention of changing their lives. They were just going to go on with their lives the way they are. I think that's a great warning for us ourselves. And you know, it's really interesting when you look at what was happening at this time, I had some passages in there about the, the power of the word that, you know, you're, they're probably familiar ones for you. But what was really neat, you know, when you look at what's happening in terms of the overall game plan right now, is here you are with the people of God that have the ark, they have the temple, they had all the stuff, all the mechanisms were there, and here's the king listening to the Bible being read, and he's cutting off the columns of the Bible, and he's throwing it into the fire, And up in Babylon, at the same time, is a Gentile king, didn't know anything about Israel before, who's being given visions of the kingdom of men. And Daniel is working with that man. And he's listening and learning about the God of the Jews. It's just fascinating to watch the irony of this situation. And it's playing out right now in this fourth and fifth year of Jehoiakim. And what a warning to ourselves that uh, God is going to fill his kingdom. He's going to find people that will fill up his kingdom. And if the mechanisms that we have today don't do it for us, he's going to find other people in other areas of the world, other groups, the Gentiles, uh, the barbarians of this world, and he will bring them into his family. So our, our job is to make sure we look at those mechanisms that we have and thank God for them today. Be glad we have Bibles and we have meetings to go to and Sunday schools. And we, we have all these things we can do, our Bible marketing and all the classes we have online and tapes we can listen to. But those are just mechanisms to get us to the goal. Don't lose focus on the goal. And the goal is that we learn to live like Jesus Christ. And that's going to be the focus of our memorial service. That's why we come week by week, so we don't lose that focus, that we committed to join with him in his death to sin, and that that will impact how we treat our families, our brethren and sisters in our ecclesias, and our friends in the world that we live in today. Thanks.